Studies, New Delhi. On behalf of ICS, let me welcome you to ICS Wednesday Seminar, an ongoing tradition since 1969. Today's seminar is part of the Institute's China in South Asia series with a focus on China's relationship with Bangladesh, implications for India. Among the countries of South Asia, Bangladesh has successfully engaged with both India and China, benefited from their investments, and it has critically balanced its relations with both nations. Therefore, today's seminar will focus on the evolving dynamics of Bangladesh's relations with China and examine its regional implications. Speaking on the topic are Ambassador Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti, former High Commissioner of India to Bangladesh and founder of DeepStrat, Dr. Smriti S. Patanayak, Research Fellow at Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, and Ambassador M. Humayun Kabir, President of the Bangladesh Enterprise Institute and former Secretary at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Government of Bangladesh. Chairing the discussion is Professor Alka Acharya, Professor at the Center for East Asian Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and Honorary Fellow with ICS. Before I invite the chair to begin the proceedings, I would now like to lay down the housekeeping rules. All participants are requested to remain muted throughout the duration of the event. Please post your questions or comments via the chat box or use the raise hand option during the Q&A. Please unmute yourself only when called upon to do so. I will now invite the chair to be begin the proceedings. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Ah, thanks, Rangoli. And uh, a very good afternoon to everybody who has joined um, the Wednesday discussion today. Um, I think the point of a chair is really quite, uh, quite limited, and especially more so when you have a set of speakers as we have brought before you today. Um, the introduction to the speakers is already given. Um, the notice says 10 to 12 minutes, but I would like to give each of the three speakers 15 minutes, and therefore I will restrict my comments um, to, to, to afterwards uh, when I have heard and uh, when there are some really uh, interesting issues that are bound to be raised uh, need some kind of uh, reflection. So I would like to request uh, Ambassador Chakravarti to uh, start and uh, take the floor for the next 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Alka. I hope you can all uh, hear me. Uh, is that okay? Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Please go on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the confirmation. Thank you, Alka. Thank you for uh, giving me the floor. Thank you, Ashok, for inviting me. And uh, and uh, th and thank you, uh, all of all of you who joined this uh, joined this webinar. Now uh, we are really talking about China's relationship with Bangladesh and implications for India. So I will. Um, shoot off a few points and uh, not make make a very elaborate kind of a, a set, uh, you know kind of presentation but basically start with the comment that uh, you know even powerful nations seek allies in international politics and smaller nations obviously seek it more uh, sort of assiduously to to balance their particularly when they are next to a large name so in our subcontinent, this has been happening for quite some time. In fact, ever since, since 1947, when Pakistan basically sold itself to the U.S., uh, saying that, look, we'll be your sort of good guy here and we'll, we'll do everything for you. But then it was not, uh, it was not, uh, and, and you can see it today in the, after the Ukraine war fallout, that smaller nations, Sweden, Finland, and others are uh, all, uh, lining up to join NATO. So this, this is a kind of a thing that happens in international politics. And we see it from time to time, depending on what developments take place. Now, uh, China, in fact, uh, as, as far as China, Bangladesh ties are concerned, China was on the wrong side of history in 1971. But today, China is, uh, is, has come a very, very long way. 
Uh, it is largest trading partner. It is a strategic uh, partner also, and um, largest trading partner, the largest, uh, you know, uh, supplier of military hardware, and many other things. The largest investor in Bangladesh today, uh, and also perhaps uh, under the BRI, the 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 country with the largest number of projects being implemented in Bangladesh. So China has come a long way, and we all know that this is a result of uh, uh, President Xi's uh, uh, push uh, under the BRI uh, um, all over the place, of course, uh, but also uh, significantly for us in South Asia uh, or in, in, in our subcontinent, where China basically seeks to, uh, seeks to increase its influence. And, and, and that leads to uh, less space for India in these countries and obviously undermines some of our uh, influence. Now, uh, China started this thing uh, a bit late. You know, China recognized Bangladesh only in 1976. And basically their, uh, their uh, relationship started growing during the regime of uh, military dictator Zia Rahman. Zia himself was, of course, pro-Pakistani, and uh, and obviously China must have felt now that Zia is there. He was cultivating an Islamic Bangladesh. The Islamists who had fled during the Liberation War were all allowed back. So they, there was this uh, you know circumstance at that time when uh, China and Pakistan both felt that this is the right time to sort of uh, engage uh, Bangladesh. And then, of course, there were several visits, and they signed various agreements. So that was the beginning. That was the trigger. And uh, Zia himself, of course, uh, uh, was not uh, particularly uh, sort of friendly towards India. So that also helped in terms of building this uh, uh, consensus about, uh, you know, to engage Bangladesh by China and Pakistan. And we all know what happened during those years when Zia was there. And then his wife, uh, Khaleda Zia, came to power. And we know what happened, uh, you know, uh, sub the support to Indian insurgents, etc., and things like that. Now, uh, so basically, the, the, it was, of course, in the last decade or so that uh, that the excessive push by China has happened, and Bangladesh has, uh, in terms of seeking a balance with India, has played the China card fairly, you know, adroitly because it wanted uh, development funds and uh, which China, Bangladesh takes, you know, receives from India as well. But here was another big source with uh, big pockets who would write checks, et cetera, uh, that would uh, help Bangladesh develop its infrastructure and various other. Uh, uh, and of course, the business partnership has grown a lot. Now, this is uh, there is also consensus today in Bangladesh that, uh, that they must have good relations with China. Uh, and this cut across the society. Uh, but they, they're not saying that they don't want good relations with India, but they want good relations with China as well, because China, they are getting, they think China can deliver more than India can. So these are some of the factors that has led to the you know, fairly rapid growth in the relationship. Uh, loans, it's, uh, you know, investments and all kinds of things are coming in. But India's contribution, of course, is also recognized. And there is a kind of a balance. And Priya Ghasina herself has said so that uh, while we both are very important development partners, our relationship with India is more organic. What she meant, of course, is the civilizational shared history, et cetera, that she meant. Now, uh, China also, in the, in the Bangladeshi perception, China uh, is seen to be non-interfering in their domestic politics, whereas India is not perceived like that. India is supposed to lean towards, you know, the Awami League and hence uh, creates uh, that India has favorites in Bangladesh. The Chinese don't uh, don't indicate that, and they they're willing to work with uh, with all of all constituencies in the in the polity. But uh, China has cultivated assiduously. Uh, with with the help of Pakistan, uh, uh, a pro-China constituency. China uses the funds and liberally to lubricate this, and Pakistan uses its Islamist network to basically, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, 
pursue its own agenda against India. And we know what that agenda is. I mean, we have seen, you know, the border, for example, fake Indian currency, terrorism, all kinds of things happening across the border. Now, China is not, Bangladesh is not the only country where in, in our subcontinent where China has uh, made, made, made very, very, very significant inroads. We look around us and we, we all know what's happening in Sri Lanka. Maldives has probably uh, come back from the brink and, uh, and uh, Myanmar, we know what's happening. But I think what's, uh, uh, what is happening today is that uh, China is, uh, is facing some kind of uh, greater amount of questioning in terms of its uh, lending, lending policies, its proposals, you know, things like what happened in Sri Lanka. So other countries have become very cautious. Bangladesh has indeed been very cautious. And, you know, these vanity projects like Hamban Kota and, you know, some, you know, the high-speed rail between uh, Dhaka and Chittagong, these have been shelved now. Uh, Bangladesh has been conscious of India's sort of concerns, mainly in the security domain. Uh, as far as implications for India, are concerned. There are three or three, four domains basically. One is, of course, security. Uh, the one is economics and the economy. Uh, one is infrastructure, and there are various other domains where we feel that China's influence uh, uh, will have implications for India. Now, <clears throat> so this 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 thing is now playing out in Bangladesh. Now, what we have seen is that uh, that uh, uh, that China has made a you know, a rash of proposals. The, at last count, there were about 27, 28 proposals or ongoing projects, and there were many more proposals. And this happened during the visit of uh, uh, President Xi, uh, Xi Jinping, when he visited uh, Dhaka and made a huge promise of $40 billion, et cetera, that they would like to put into the BRI. Now, Bangladesh, by the way, has been urging India also to join the BRI, thinking that, this would be a good thing for all of us in the subcontinent. Of course, we have taken a different view. And China made probably an error in, in designating BCIM, which, which predates the BRI, uh, and said that everything will come under the BRI. Now, this is obviously a very Chinese way of dealing with it because it came from the top. And nobody probably, even if somebody pointed out that, you know, don't keep BCIM in this, China thought India will fall in line and uh, we'll accept all this. But uh, this did not happen. So I think this, this created some problem for China because the BCIM is now dead. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, I wouldn't even say in the deep freezer, but it's dead. I mean, I don't think there is any chance of revival uh, of the BCIM. Now, India's stakes in Bangladesh are obviously higher. China enjoys a bit of, uh, what shall I say, uh, a cushion because it does not it does not have geographical contiguity with, uh, with Bangladesh, but it does not give up its hope of building ports there and maybe, you know, influencing Bangladesh by giving two submarines and now building a submarine jetty um, in Chittagong, near Chittagong. So but, but Bangladesh uh, has been quite close to China in terms of defense uh, relationship. And uh, China has basically begun the cultivation to, uh, cultivation via the military. And uh, today, China uh, supplies 70% of the military hardware uh, to, to, to Bangladesh. Now, India's stakes are high because we really don't know what China will ultimately want to do in Bangladesh. So we have to count on our good, 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 uh, you know, uh, good, good relations with Bangladesh uh, to see that China does not uh, become a concern for India in the security domain. On the infrastructure space, I think the Padma Bridge and various other bridges that are being constructed, the railway lines, both 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 uh, both uh, countries are doing it. China in a much bigger way. The Padma Bridge has been inaugurated. These, by the way, are uh, we have always always seen these connectivities as benefiting both countries. Ultimately, Bangladesh will benefit if it is interconnected with India. Northeast India will benefit if it is connected with Bangladesh. And uh, so this is something that I don't think India should worry too much in terms of physical connectivity. But yes, in building of ports and, you know, we don't want to see Chinese ships 
you know, ho hovering around ports in Bangladesh, in the Bay of Bengal, for example. So this is something which is going to uh, be watched very carefully by India. Now, um, two minutes, please, Ambassador. Yes, of course, I'll finish very quickly. But then, then we also have, uh, you know, China uh, getting into the energy domain. There is a balancing of energy projects also between India and China. So this balancing is go is going on fairly fairly cautiously, and I would say successfully by Bangladesh. And but yet. Uh, we don't know if there is, uh, in, a, in future, if there is another government in uh, Bangladesh, which is, say, follows the, follows the lineage of the BNP and Jamaat, then we can't say what's going to happen. But, uh, but there's, there has to be some way of ensuring that, uh, that China's footprint in Bangladesh does not go beyond, uh, beyond a certain point, which will cause security concerns to India. So I think this is very well known. I think uh, it is very well known, not only in Bangladesh, but of course, from our point of view, it has been there for quite some time. Now, I, I think since the time is short, I will not uh, go along. There is other, of course, uh, a little bit of concerns on the digital and cyberspace side where um, Chinese uh, you know, companies, particularly those involved in the Huawei project or any other cyber cyber related projects about espionage and things like that uh, in India, which is which is there. Of course, China can do it sitting in Beijing or somewhere else. But if they get another you know nearer sort of a outpost in Bangladesh, that would be a cause of concern for us. But China has also made some uh, you know errors. I would say from uh, from uh, I think from any point of view. This whole threat that the Chinese ambassador gave, you know, delivered to Bangladesh about don't even think about joining the Quad, our relations will be destroyed, etc. Of course, there was a huge pushback from Bangladesh. So I think basically what we are seeing today is a very, uh, a very balanced relationship. Uh, but who knows about the future? Thank you very much. Well, thank you. A rather chilling kind of a conclusion. Who knows about the future? Uh, I, I, can, uh, I can see that you take a fairly zero-sum approach to this whole question of China's role in Bangladesh. And uh, the fact that um, everything that China gains will be at India's expense. And uh, that there are some very significant advantages that China has, which India doesn't. Uh, which obviously give it greater leverage. So in that sense, I would say that you are, um, uh, you, you have provided a perspective which uh, would look at China's role with extreme suspicion, caution, and uh, clearly the possibility of uh, some kind of a cooperative framework here is uh, quite ruled out as far as you're concerned, because you say that the BCIM is dead, not even in the freezer. So, right. Um, thank you very much for that perspective. I, I just want to say, Alka, that on the point of infrastructure, I did mention that there is a, there is a positive aspect to the building of infrastructure. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, now that um, uh, Ambassador Kabir has uh, dealt with his uh, traffic uh, Jam successfully and has able to and is able to join us. Uh, I would uh, now request him. Now, uh, good to see you again. I remember our meeting in Kunming and we had a very very interesting conversation at that point of time. Um, I think uh, I was very passionate about uh, having some kind of uh, China India Bangladesh framework to take care of maritime challenges and. Uh, well, a lot of water has flown down many bridges since then. So I look forward to listening to your views and whether there are any echoes from that distant conversation. Over to you. You are muted, I think. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chairperson. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for uh, recalling our last discussion and uh, the uh, very rich panelists, uh, those who are there, are my friends, uh, Binak, Shruti, uh, uh, and I'm seeing uh, Professor Bharsin also here. 
and uh, other uh, participants uh, on, online on this discussion. I think this is a timely and interesting discussion. So I'm grateful that you have uh, brought me into this in, in this process. So um, I think Pinak has laid out uh, the Chinese objectives in South Asia. Uh, so let me organize my thoughts in four areas. One is that uh, what are the basic drivers from the Chinese side and from the Bangladesh side with regard to the uh, uh, development of relationship? That is one area. And then I will touch on what Bang how Bangladesh looks at this relationship. Uh, Ambassador Pinak has mentioned, alluded to some, but I will then. And then how does it impact a relationship with India, but this is where I think Bangladesh has got its own mind. So I'd like to share that as well. And eventually, I mean, what is our expectation? How where do we see uh, a relationship among us three, China, Bangladesh, and India going in the uh, coming years? So uh, with regard to the uh, uh, Chinese relationship or Chinese focus on Bangladesh or South Asia as a whole, we all know that China had historical attention or interest in this area. I'm not going to the that, but uh, my sense is that China considers, uh, and that's what we gathered also from discussion with our Chinese friends, um, South Asia is a neighbor. So it is very obvious. Uh, Ashok, uh, nice seeing you and thank you very much. And let me interrupt and thank you for <laughs> inviting and, and taking the trouble to keep me in the loop. And also, we are all good friends from old days. When we were young, our hair was not that uh, gray, I should say. <laughs> okay. So what I was saying uh, was um, that... You... Yeah, looking great, Ashok, by the way. Uh, now, China, if China <laughs> considers South Asia as a neighbor, so obviously Chinese interest in South Asia or South Asian interest in China is an, is, is an obvious fact. And I think if we look at South Asia, uh, Chinese relationship with all the countries in South Asia uh, goes back to long time uh, uh, in the past. Uh, and I would say that the relationship between China and Bangladesh is perhaps a new component among the, uh, in the relationship among the countries uh, in South Asia. Uh, so from that perspective, let me say China, we understand, as I say, China wants uh, to have a relationship as neighbor with South Asia. Obviously, all the countries will come into the picture since China has become you know, a, a strong maritime uh, nation in terms of doing its trade and other things. Obviously, the maritime zone or maritime area would also come into picture. Uh, South Asian economies of all the countries, I mean, as a whole, uh, economies of all the countries are coming up. So obviously, China as an upcoming economic power would like to have some opportunities here. And obviously there are challenges, but obviously China would like to explore these things. And now in Bangladeshi, from Bangladeshi perspective, I mean, how we have seen, I can tell you a few things or a few observations from my own, uh, I would say experience. China came to Bangladesh and there are a couple of areas I should mention that Chinese, we can look at Chinese, mm -hmm relationship with Bangladesh. One is a needs perspective, need perspective, need from Bangladesh side, and perhaps from Chinese side, buying friendship from our side, buying uh, things that would help us physically. And here I should say the first element of first Chinese uh, interaction with Bangladesh or Bangladesh interaction with China started with our infrastructure development in the 80s. So that is where China started uh, coming in a big way to Bangladesh. And by the time I should, by the, by the way, I should also mention that at that time, Indian doesn't have that priority uh, in its foreign relations, for example. So China came and Bangladesh, China helped Bangladesh in terms of building its infrastructure. And uh, I can only tell you that uh, so far, Bangladesh has built, uh, China has built 11 uh, major projects in Bangladesh in terms of building bridges and roads and those kind of stuff. And projects, uh, uh, many projects are on the pipeline and, and uh, as uh, uh, Pinak has mentioned. And after 2016, under BRI, the China has proposed a lot of things, but Bangladesh has been cautious. And I would say that Bangladesh has rather been choosy in terms of what we need 
and what China can provide. So that is there. And although under BRI, a lot of offers are there, but Bangladesh has been, I would say, circumspect in regard to choosing which project China, Bangladesh should invite China and which project Bangladesh should not invite China. So the, this is the infrastructure and development area was one area. And I should also say that in terms of participation in our developmental programs, uh, China has been a partner for a long time. I mean, and China has been giving us support, uh, for example, uh, $170 million every year since 2015. Uh, and uh, they have given also some amount as a grant, for example. Uh, so that created a positive impression about China in Bangladesh. But, uh, and also with regard to trade, uh, China and India both are e equally important to us. China is number one in terms of our input source and India is second. So Bangladesh is now emerging as an export driven country. Now our export is contingent on our import. So obviously when our export is growing, our import is also growing both from India and China. So China is number one, uh, holding the number one place and India is holding number uh, second place in terms of our import source. So from an, our economic uh, uh, growth area, our trade area, China, relationship between Bangladesh and China has been growing for obvious reasons, as I have said. And of late, you can see that you know, during the COVID period, unfortunately, fortunately, China has been, has been a good support to Bangladesh. And uh, uh, on the G2G basis, 75 million uh, uh, vaccines were provided to Bangladesh. Um, they some offered some gift also, but what is important is the Sino, uh, some of the Sinopharm vaccines or Sinovac vaccines are, are currently produced under joint venture between Bangladeshi companies and the Chinese technology. So this is something that has uh, given some extra mileage to uh, the relationship, Chinese relationship with Bangladesh or Bangladesh relationship with China. And if we move to other areas other than economic, although the economy is a major driver of our relationship, and here I must add that even during, just after our independence, when China didn't recognize Bangladesh as rather China was on the other side of the aisle, Bangladesh wanted to build up relationship with China. And he sent the senior most, Bangladesh, at that time, Bangladeshi diplomat who was who, were, who had spent entire time of 71 in Beijing to Myanmar to build up relationship with China. So Bangladesh has uh, always thought and considered China as an important pillar of relationship and as a, as a friend. Now, from obviously from this, that has been uh, cemented over the years, strategic convergence on many areas have uh, come in. For example, Bangladesh believes in one China policy. We are very vocal on that. Uh, and Bangladesh, as Pinak has mentioned, and I also repeat that, China, Bangladeshi defense needs is largely made by, by the Chinese uh, side. But now Bangladesh is also trying to diversify. And the last area I should say where recently the relationship has, I would say, got a boost was the uh, uh, finding some solution to the Rohingya issue. Uh, you know, while India did that, I must say, uh, at the initial phase, China came in and China at least gave us a hand. And under the trilateral arrangement, some exploration has been made. No progress has been achieved yet, but China has shown its interest to engage with Bangladesh to resolve the, Myanmar, the Rohingya issue with regard to Myanmar. And by the way, I can tell you that for Bangladeshi, common Bangladeshi, is anybody helping to resolve Rohingya issue uh, 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 scores a lot of points from public opinion uh, perspective. Uh, the last one, I should say that um, the political relationship between the two countries are okay, I should say. Bangladesh has been cautious, careful, and relationship is going on. And last one, I should say that uh, blue economy, ICT, RMG technology, agro base, water resources, these are the areas where China is interested. And I can only tell you that if in certain areas, if our, I mean, I would say in terms of resource sharing, resource utilization, if South Asia cannot manage its relationship well, then I, I, I would not discount the possibility 
that China could come in and try to help us. And then one will have to decide whether we should accept Chinese offer or not. So these are some of the areas in terms of our relationship uh, with regard to China. Overall, I can tell you that one advantage China enjoys is China has been maintaining a consensus on the political domain with regard to having Bangladeshi population support. So if you look at the political parties, across the political parties, all political parties are in almost consensus about the nature of relationship Bangladesh should maintain with China. So that's an advantage for China. And also in the domain of public opinion, of public support, China, as Pinak has said, we don't have any problem areas between China and Bangladesh. That's why China perhaps is fortunate that China enjoys a kind of problem-free image in Bangladesh that helps to reinforce the relationship on both sides. Now, impact on India. I mean, this is a very relevant question. I think I would be a little nuanced in the sense that uh, from Bangladeshi perspective, we are a little concerned about the tension, growing tension between China and India. The, why? Number one point is that Bangladesh believes that the peaceful and cordial relationship between Bang, uh, China and India is always helpful for a better peaceful environment in South Asia. And particularly for Bangladesh, to whom or to us, China is, uh, is a good friend, India is a good friend. And we want to maintain our relationship with both in equal amount. And we believe that if there is a, they are in good understanding, that will always help us to promote our interest as well. So from our perspective, we think we do not always see the China-India relationship from a, I would say, adversarial pers perspective. Rather, we would like to see a complementary perspective or see the relationship from a complementary perspective. And that's why Pinath has rightly said, Bangladesh has been one of the major drivers of Kunmin dialogue since 1999, which eventually met or morphed into the BCIM. So we still believe that that would be a good idea. And why it's a good idea? Because good idea in the sense that apart from, I know India has particular security concern, but beyond the security concern, from an economic point of view, uh, the Eastern India, uh, then uh, Northeast India, Bangladesh, and the Southwestern China would be benefited from this BCIM corridor. And that's why we are very strongly supportive of that. And we are sad that it has not moved forward, but I think it would be better if India, up until 2013, India was positive, but after that, India has slightly, um, I would say, their support has gone down. So we hope that India will uh, find some value in the, that kind of relationship. Then Chinese uh, investment could be mutually beneficial. Why, how it has been mutually beneficial? You know, I can mention about infrastructure. If Chinese investment in infrastructure is made in Bangladesh, that could be helpful for India to connect to its Northeast through utilizing that infrastructure. And uh, we are hearing the rumor that Indian companies would be using Podda Bridge uh, for expansion of their business, communication, transport, and many other things. So I think if Chinese, China invests in Bangladesh, and if that investment is beneficial to all three countries, I think that should be welcome and that should be appreciated. So from Bangladeshi point of view, a Chinese investment in infrastructure, we don't see it from a zero sum game, nor do we see Indian investment in Bangladesh infrastructure as a zero sum game where China could be excluded. So that's our own infrastructure. And that's, that is one area that we believe is important. And we also, as you can see, that Bangladesh is a part of BRI. At the same time, we are also a part of the uh, 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 Indo-Pacific Partnership. And here, our priority has always been very uh, vocally pronounced by our even Prime Minister, both in Dalian in 2019 and in Delhi. Our priority is economy. We are not interested in the security or strategic uh, competition among powers. But we want to be a part of that because we, we, are, we are a nation in this region. So I think we have a valid uh, reason to be a part of any process that evolves here. And we would like to be part, but our priority would be 
to promote or nudge this kind of organization or infrastructure towards uh, more economic relate towards promoting more economic relationship uh, uh, and 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 uh, other or like I mean uh, allied uh, factors. And we have we believe that we have the common challenges like poverty, unemployment, health, environment, human resource development. So I think that's where. Uh, India, China, and Bangladesh, we all can work together. And it's not mutually exclusive. And certain areas, as uh, uh, Madam Chair, you have mentioned, that I, my, uh, my personal view is that uh, on the maritime domain, I think this is, a, this, is no, uh, this is not an exclusive zone to anybody or any country. It should be a common uh, area where all countries can contribute positively and all countries can benefit from that as well. So our expectation is that Bangladesh, India, China, we should work together. And we don't look at the relationship from one prism only, from, from multiple uh, prisms, where it could be mutually beneficial to all the countries. And it could also help the common people to really understand the value. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, am, uh, I must say, I'm, I'm really delighted that you have lost none of that fervor for the cooperative framework and possibilities, <laughs> the possibilities really that, that we, can, uh, we can think about. Um, you know, what comes across very well and, and maybe part of it would be unintended by you, but nevertheless comes out is the, the Chinese have really gone about their business very systematically and uh, in, a, in, in a manner that is, uh, to quote them, you know, win-win uh, throughout. Uh, keeping the sensitivities in mind, keeping the calculations of internal politics in mind, uh, they have actually managed to make themselves uh, pretty indispensable uh, in many ways uh, for the Bangladeshi economic uh, development. And now the conversation is moving towards <coughs> maritime security concerns and particularly the, the Rohingya, what you, what you said about the Rohingya, uh, that, that really. So what comes out from here, which as I said, could have been unintended, is the fact that India has been found wanting very sadly uh, in the terms of the, the expeditiousness with which we have either responded or come up with our own contributions, proposals, uh, and as you said, that in the 80s, India was not very interested. So clearly, uh, what comes out from your presentation is uh, a, sad, uh, a rather sad saga of lost opportunities as far as India Bangladesh are concerned, and a rather um, forbidding kind of a saga, but for India particularly, as far as China Bangladesh uh, partnership is concerned. Um, so thank you very much. I think that has been very, very in, uh, uh, interesting presentation. And I would now turn to Smriti, whose uh, writings I have read with great, great instruction over the years when I've been wanting to look at, uh, you know, uh, internal dynamics. She's extremely, extremely um, detailed and meticulous in her research. So I, I really look forward to listening to you, Smriti. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, ICS, for this uh, invitation. Uh, in fact, I'm going to start from where uh, Human Bai left in terms of the uh, public opinion. I think because uh, public opinion has been a very uh, significant aspect of uh, facilitating any kind of engagement of a particular country with another. Uh, because like um, Ambassador Chakrabarti was also speaking about the narratives which was created mostly, uh, you know, what actually surprises the Indian uh, strategic thinker is basically a country which opposed Bangladesh uh, admission to the United Nations have emerged not just as the largest trading partner, though of course the Bangladeshis tell me you have a lot of non-illegal uh, trade, so which makes up, of course, that's, that's just a you know, matter <laughs> of uh, this thing. Trade. Yeah, it's trying to you know assure that you know don't bother about the. Uh, you know, it emerging as the largest trading partner, but also the strategic partner. Of course, I also remember with, uh, uh, you know, I have some memories of Bangladesh High Commissioner, uh, Said Mozam Ali, who said that, uh, you know, India should not be bothered about uh, strategic partnership with China because uh, India uh, is strategic partnership plus, 
in that sense, you know, we, our relationship has been extremely close. So therefore, you know, this nomenclature of uh, defining a particular relationship should not uh, bother India. And I, I completely agree uh, with that because the depth of uh, relationship which India shares with Bangladesh is very different uh, compared to the depth of relationship with China shares with Bangladesh. Of course, I completely agree with uh, Ambassador Kabir when he said that uh, China has its own strategic interest. Uh, the Malacca dilemma, uh, the development of Yunnan province, uh, uh, you know, getting the basically uh, connecting to the nearest uh, seaport has been part of China's own developmental uh, strategy. Of course, there is a strategic dimension in, in terms of the India-China uh, contest. So therefore, I would say that the politics of relationship, politics of Bangladesh's relationship with China and in, uh, India is very, very significant. And uh, there are important stakeholders of this particular relationship. So it is not uh, like, uh, you know, there are people who argue for uh, better relationship with China. Uh, there are uh, people who argue for better relationship with India. Uh, of course, what uh, Bangladesh is currently doing is it has, I think, managed its bilateral relationship with India and China in an excellent manner. I think probably the best in, in the subcontinent. And therefore, it has been able to reap the benefit of its bilateral relationship with both without, unlike the past, uh, without playing the China card or without trying to uh, play one against the other, I think uh, the current pattern uh, looks like that they have engaged both and benefited from, from both. And that has been significant. That is why uh, China's presence, though of course not uh, exactly its presence only in Bangladesh, but uh, when India looks at China's presence, it looks at from a uh, larger uh, subcontinental framework than only uh, its presence in Bangladesh, because I think it needs to be looked uh, in a broader framework. So when I was speaking of the politics of relationship, I often come across uh, terminology of uh, China being benign, and India being hegemonic uh, and big brother. And therefore, when you look at uh, the statements which after each visit of uh, Bangladeshi political leaders uh, to Beijing or uh, any politi in, uh, like the president or the prime minister or including the defense minister's visit to uh, Bangladesh from China side, if you look at the joint statement, which I studied carefully, uh, most of the joint statement which has been issued from the Chinese side, I always see, you know, I won't say from the Chinese side, the bilateral, you know, it's a bilateral joint statement. It always emphasizes on the word uh, sovereignty, uh, equality, no interference in the internal affairs. I think any country in South Asia probably will put an emphasis on this. But unfortunately or fortunately, India is always intertwined with the domestic politics of each of its neighbor, neighboring countries. Because not just because of the partisan, you have familial ties, you also have uh, very close uh, ties between the political parties of the countries. So therefore, whenever there has been any kind of uh, problem or any kind of challenge, each of these political leadership has, uh, in fact, drawn India's attention to the domestic development. So one can say that, uh, you know, while, uh, for example, some of the attention which is basically put on what India does domestically in Bangladesh or gives any statement uh, on Bangladesh domestic politics actually does not get the similar kind of attention as far as China is concerned. I'll give two examples. One is the famous uh, Sujata Singh's uh, visit to Bangladesh, which uh, you know often uh, that is always referred as India's interference in the domestic politics as if only with Sujata Singh it started. Uh, there are many ways, you know, interference are in many ways in terms of uh, India's own interest because India, India has always, my argument has always been that India has always looked for stability in the neighborhood. You know, we can speak of democracy. It could be an inclusive government. It could be a democracy, but it is, it is mostly the stability framework. So Suzata Singh's visit I saw in the context of uh, what was happening at that point of time as far as the politics is concerned. But when I compare Sujata Singh's visit with the recent statement, like for example, uh, Li uh, Ziming, I don't know how to pronounce it, the Chinese ambassador to Bangladesh, uh, when he uh, advised Bangladesh that you should not join Quad and warned that the country's relations with China will substantially be damaged. This is the statement in January. Of course, there was reaction from Bangladesh, 
And similarly, recently in June, uh, the Bangladesh ambassador was called uh, um, uh, by the foreign office and was again asked that, uh, you know, China believes that countries in the region, including Bangladesh, will bear in mind the fundamental interests of their own countries and the region, uphold independence, reject the Cold War mentality and block politics. Uh, you know, you, I, I saw there were certain uh, kind of reaction only from the foreign ministry, but I don't see the similar kind of reaction as Sujata Singh's uh, meeting with the political parties uh, was concerned, the kind of reaction which, uh, you know, that attracted. So therefore, I see that within the domestic constituency, while Bangladesh appears to me, I may be wrong, more sensitive uh, towards India's statement or omissions and commissions and such kind of sensitivities probably is not uh, displayed as far as China is concerned. The reason could be political because uh, when you give statement against India or speak about the Indian politics, it has a uh, kind of resonance in the domestic politics. You know, there are uh, stakeholders, there are political part parties, people understand. And this is something, for example, uh, during my stay in Dhaka University, some of the time, when you go out of the campus, you see a student leader making speech and all the rickshaw pullers are listening with rapt attention. And it would be about India and all these things. So some of the time, you know, I was wondering that people are very, very political because, you know, somewhere it touches them. In terms of their daily life, India affects Bangladesh like no other country, whether it is a flood, whether it is um, like, for example, a crisis in beef at one point of time or sugar or anything. India affects day-to-day -day life and people really relate to India. And if you speak to about China, I don't think, uh, you know, people can relate in that sense. So that is where the politics of relationship uh, becomes very, very significant. Uh, second is, uh, you know, in terms of the defense cooperation, you know, this is one of the area. Uh, also, I do not see in Bangladesh, of course, I can understand from the Chinese perspective, it is the largest supplier of the uh, arms to, you know, to Bangladesh, second largest supplier after Pakistan. And Bangladesh is currently trying to diversify its source of uh, supplies uh, because of the force 2030 where they are modernizing their armed forces. But like, for example, the Bangladesh-China Defense Cooperation Agreement signed in 2001, I was trying to look at the debate surrounding this because when the 500 million uh, credit line which was extended to Bangladesh by India, I think in 2016, there was a lot of public reaction against this particular credit line. Uh, the, many people, common people keep on saying that, you know, why should we take a credit line from India? What, what can we buy? Even if you keep on arguing that there are uh, certain things which India, you know, one can purchase from India, like offshore petrol vehicle and other stuff, which India has sold both to Maldives and uh, Sri Lanka. Also, uh, some helicopters, transport helicopters, helicopters I think, um, you know, to Afghanistan. But as far as Bangladesh is concerned, this particular 500 million uh, credit line has not yet been operationalized, has not been spent. Uh, so therefore, I always get very little surprised that while the Bangladeshis did not question the 2001 defense agreement uh, with China, and you will not find uh, any kind of uh, reference what it contains, I tried to figure out in terms of that what exactly, of course, you won't know, but basically what it contains. But uh, there was a lot of hue and cry, not just about this 500 million credit line, but also about the uh, coastal surveillance radar, which was part of the MOU, I think in 2017, Hasina's visit, uh, there was nothing, uh, you know, which uh, came up in that. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, the, another two points I have, then I will just uh, finish one is that, you know, the BRI, of course, uh, it is going to bring in 42 billion, uh, both private and the government uh, um, investment in Bangladesh. Bangladesh is where, Bangladesh is were very, very happy when this particular uh, BRI project were announced in 2016. And that point of time, even people also said that, you know, it is uh, 42 billion versus 2 billion uh, Indian credit line at that point of time. Of course, now it is touching with uh, grants, uh, that is the, um, I'm forgetting the terminology, the grant uh, projects which India is doing in the rural areas. Uh, it is coming uh, nearly around uh, 10 billion. 
So BRI, of course, is uh, China's part. You know, it is basically strategy towards the Indian Ocean and India, Indo-Pacific. But Bangladesh, I think, uh, of course, you know, as uh, Ambassador Kabir was also mentioning, it is very significant because after all, it is bringing in the investment and you do not have the kind of, uh, you know, for, for example, uh, Chinese are always known uh, to not just to, uh, you know, they have, I would say, one window of clearance. You know, you don't have to run to the finance ministry, to the MEA, to the railways if the investment is on the railways or to the commerce ministry if it is some free trade. So, you know, the kind of juggling around which India does, China doesn't have that. So that way it is much simpler as far as, as, far as investment is concerned. No uh, string attached investment and it is fast. They build very, very fast. The model which India has adopted, I think probably uh, doesn't suit, uh, you know, the kind of investment these countries are looking. And Bangladesh has been very, very careful as far as Chinese investment are concerned. Not everything has been considered. If I'm not mistaken, uh, under the BRI, uh, currently, I think Bangladesh has received nearly uh, little more than $1 billion, which has been uh, dispersed as far as Bangladesh is concerned. I think probably India needs to look at uh, that because China remains sixth largest in terms of the disbursement of loan and India is uh, 13. This is the 50 year period which uh, the economic relations uh, department of the Bangladesh finance ministry has brought out a report, very, very interesting data, uh, which contains from 1971 to 2001, and I think one needs to look at look at it. Uh, in terms of the Rohingyas, I, you know, I do agree that there is a lot of expectation from India. Of course, uh, India has its own uh, uh, concern as far as Myanmar is concerned, because it is the other uh, significant uh, counterinsurgency partner as far as India's Northeast is concerned. So Bangladesh is one leg of the country's insurgency strategy of India. And Myanmar is on the other leg. So obviously, though the Chinese agreed, you know, they in fact uh, the three-point agreement which Bangladesh and Myanmar agreed, uh, none of them have been, uh, you know, been able to go back the Rohingyas uh, because unless until the domestic uh, rules uh, or regulation, which in fact in the first place resulted in the Rohingya expulsion, if those are not amended, I think it becomes a little uh, difficult. So therefore. I really do not know notionally we can say China came to, uh, came to Bangladesh's help, but actually if uh, you know, I look at it, I think probably I would uh, have a slight difference with Ambassador Kabir when I argue that at least India tried to provide whatever it can because it could not uh, intervene and could not convince the uh, Myanmaris. So therefore there was Operation Insaniyat where uh, you know, aid was provided. And also 50,000 houses, which is be being built under Indian project in the Rakhine state, perhaps keeping in mind if the Rohingya one day goes back and these houses will be available, keeping in mind that the repatriation will happen. And towards the uh, end, uh, on, in terms of the implications uh, for India, I would very quickly say that I think, uh, you know, the security, economic and culture, the two countries, Bangladesh, India, uh, are intertwined. So in a sense, uh, I would not say that uh, it is going to be a zero sum game. China has its own interest. Bangladesh, uh, sorry, India also has its own interest. Similarly, Bangladesh also has its own interest. Like uh, Bangladesh has been very cautious about certain security uh, interest of India and has respected that in the context of the Sonaria port. I can give a, this, that is one of the examples. But otherwise, in terms of uh, you know, the implications for India, Though China is, uh, you know, the largest uh, uh, provider of military hardware as far as Bangladesh is concerned, sorry, second largest provider. So in a sense, China has posited itself in the traditional security sphere as far as the state is concerned. I think India can come in as far as the non-traditional security uh, sphere is concerned because the major challenge, the immediate challenge for Bangladesh is non-traditional security, whether it is the flow of the refugees, whether it's, it is the climate change and its impact in terms, in terms of flooding, uh, in terms of uh, the human humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. I think there is a lot of scope for India and Bangladesh to cooperate on the non-traditional non security uh, side, because that is something which is immediate. And that is something which binds uh, India to the people of Bangladesh. Because non-traditional security, one, one is speaking, one is speaking about the people. 
because you are speaking of flooding, you are speaking of rescue, you are speaking of climate change, you are speaking about uh, you know, flora, fauna, the river water, and that kind of thing. So, of course, I can understand in the context of river water, there are much to be done, but that is where India can build in its relationship rather than being concerned that, uh, you know, uh, Bangladesh is the second largest uh, military provider of the military hardware. Of course, we are also in the Rupur nuclear power plant in terms of energy, co energy cooperation, both China and India have significantly invested in Bangladesh's uh, energy sector, obviously, this is something which is going to be significant. And therefore, I would say that India has its own strength, the strength of the people, the strength of uh, culture, the interaction, and probably some of the time when Bangladeshis uh, speak uh, or criticize India, and some of the time I feel it is, you know, it comes under that familiarity, breeds contempt kind of thing. So, you know, they know India, they can criticize India. The, all of them have some experience of India. So obviously when they speak, they speak from that. And I, I don't think any much of many of the Bangladeshis have any experience of China. So when they speak about China, actually they don't have any knowledge. So probably we get very uh, concerned about uh, this kind of, you know, uh, public opinion. But I think uh, uh, I will end by saying that uh, there are, uh, you know, it, it. I would not see it uh, within the framework of the zero sum game, I would say that uh, on many aspects there are win-win situation. In some aspect, it could be zero-sum game, but I think the win-win aspect is going to uh, probably dominate, uh, you know, this trilateral relationship, uh, which to some extent address the concerns that the three countries have about uh, each other. But within the larger framework of India-China relationship, I think once that falls in place, the other relationship will definitely fall, fall in place. Thank you so much. Ah, thank you so much. Uh, also, <laughs> it was a, it was indeed a very very uh, interesting presentation. Again, uh, I'm afraid uh, Ambassador Kabir has got some very hard questions to answer that came out of <laughs> Smriti's presentation. But you know, I really like the focus on the politics and the people centric approach that you have taken uh, because it certainly suddenly opens up. Uh, the the arena where uh, India has uh, a tremendous amount of uh, strength and resilience. Uh, the point that you made is really what uh, is uh, both a uh, question um, to reflect upon as well as uh, something that we can advance and promote uh, is how, you know, India's interactions in the, with its neighbors have this long history uh, so they're culturally very, very rich. But uh, as we enter into the nation state kind of phase and the sovereign territorial kind of uh, uh, frameworks, uh, these cultural linkages have uh, unfortunately tended to be seen as kind of leverages for interference. And uh, so it, you know, it's been a double-edged kind of a sword, but why is it that despite such strong people to people ties, we have not been able to move. And as you said, the Chinese are seen as far more um, non-interfering, non-invasive uh, role. So I think uh, somewhere we need to look at also this problem that we have. I mean, for instance, you say that they know a lot about India. So they would obviously be familiar with the fact that in India's domestic politics, uh, Bangladeshi has now become a kind of a code word also. Uh, for a whole lot of things. So what I'm saying is that uh, what you see as a strength can actually backfire given the domestic politics in, in a lot of ways. And, and the last point that I'd like to uh, react to is that as you talk about the non-traditional threats which have opened up a larger space for cooperation um, compared to the much more um, strategic um, challenges vis-a-vis -vis China that come in the traditional areas. You know, paradoxically, non-traditional um, threats actually argue or make a stronger case for um, cooperation across the, across the board. That it is not, you can't just tell the floods that you stop here and don't go there kind of thing. So, in fact, we are making an argument for a larger framework for cooperation. 
Um, so maybe that that could be one way. Of, and last thing, uh, sorry, I must raise this here because, and this is addressed to Ambassador uh, Kabir as well. What about the, you, you're looking at the domestic politics. Don't the Bangladeshis have any concerns about the Chinese dam building projects? See, we are so excited and, uh, in, in our country about these dams and how they are going to cut off water. Now, Bangladesh is also a lower riparian state. Uh, are there any kind of concerns about possible impact on their access to water resources uh, that may then be a factor? So I'll just leave it here and thank you all very much. It has been a very, very fascinating set of uh, presentations. Uh, uh, the floor is open. We've got 25 minutes, which is a huge time, and I'm sure there'll be many questions. Uh, what I'll do is I will just kickstart the process by asking all our uh, three pa panelists to just take three minutes, not, not three, actually, two minutes, if they want to make a specific point before we uh, open the floor up. Uh, so I already see Ambassador Kabir. Uh, yes, even so, all three we will go in uh, uh, with with Ambassador Kabir first, then Ambassador okay. Chakravarti, and then Smriti. Two two minutes each, please, because I don't yes, want to cut yes. into Thank this. you. Yes. Thank you very much. Two minutes. Number one, the, starting from the last point that you had made. Uh, yes, Bangladesh is an obvious concern because we have the lower right period. So whoever does build. Uh, 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 any obstruction upstairs uh, or upstream will affect us. So we are really concerned. And we, what we really feel that Bangladesh, India, and China should work together. And now the issue is non-traditional. Uh, Suthi has mentioned, this could be one non-traditional area. How could you resolve the Brahmaputra uh, issue without the involvement of China? And so obviously China comes into picture, India, China, Bangladesh, we can very well, we all three can work together. So this is one. Second thing is, uh, another question that you have asked, I think uh, uh, Shruti mentioned about that. I mean, yes, uh, intimacy breeds uh, contempt sometimes. I can give you one example. In every house in Bangladesh, the ladies are watching star, Jalsha or other stuff. But ask them about how do they look at India? They will say, oh, India? I will not make any comment. And now if you ask me, having served in India and being a Bangladeshi, being trained in India in 1971 during our liberation war, India most frequently forgets the people. It prefers to build up relationship always on state to state basis. When you do that, when you do that government to government relationship, Sometimes people may not like it, depending on the political environment of the country. I was in Nepal for three years during the Mao, peak of Maoist insurgency and the transition of Maoist insurgency into mainstream politics. I mean, my friends, I will not name, my friends were saying, how could you read? I couldn't read it. I said, because you are only working with the government officials. Why don't you talk to the people? You will find a different picture there. So my, I would say, the Indo-Bangladesh relationship could be framed in two uh, or four pillars, government to government and people to people. And that's what we, we have seen in 1971. And that was the best of our relationship, solid and understanding each other 100%. So under, until and unless that kind of dynamic is created, gaps should be there and you understand everybody wants to be, everybody grows up. So when you grow up, you have your own mind. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody grows up. I mean, that's really uh, the question is, do we, uh, as we grow up, how do we keep those bonds which we had as strong? Okay, Ambassador Chakrabarti. You're muted. I think comparing apples and oranges always is a problem. You know, what China has done, what India has done, etc. cetera. Uh, Humayun made a point about India tends to do more state to state and less uh, to the people. I, I don't see it that way. Uh, what about China? What has China done for, uh, you know, in terms of people to people? I don't know what China has done. Humayun may have better information. The other thing is that what he said, and I think I wrote about this, that, that 
that this intimacy between India and Bangladesh does breed problem, does, is a breeding ground for various attitudes and mindsets. There is a legacy issue, you know, beginning from the two nation theory, partition, etc. It hasn't gone away in my view. I would assert here, I mean, with, uh, with due apologies to Humayun, who is a lovely, lovely friend and a freedom fighter, that 30% of Bangladeshis, I would say even today, did not want separation from Pakistan. And uh, I would say that is the constituency which continues to exist. And Humayun can correct me. And uh, it, 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 it is there. So there is a view and a mindset. There is a prism through which India is seen. One, one example. The adverse trade uh, balance with China is far, far larger than adverse trade balance with India. But if you look at the decibel level of the hype that is created in Bangladesh, there is a huge difference. India is castigated, India is put in the dock, India is in the doghouse all the time, but nothing about China. As he said, China is more benign. But but why on this issue, which is a completely technical thing, adverse things happens, you will hear nothing. No criticism of China. I'm not complaining. It's their wish what to do. But there is a method to this hyping up. And, and I know I don't want to get into it because it is, it is something that Bangladeshis use as a diplomatic tool, in my view, as leverage against India. So I think that is one point. The other thing, of course, the last point, is uh, about the uh, about the, uh, the 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 this this, this uh, thing about uh, working together, you know, with China, Bangladesh, and India. Uh, I hope Humayun knows that China refuses to give even flood data to India. So where, where, what are, what are we talking about? Despite an agreement, it stops giving data because it feels that it it can get away with it, and there's nothing you can do. Uh, so there are many of these issues that are there. So this, this hope about all working together does not suit China. China does not want to work with <laughs> India. China I... wants to be a hegemon. <laughs> right. Okay, I, there are many questions coming up now. So uh, we, in fact, this, this theme is going to come up again. Ambassador Chakravarti, you'll have to come in again. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but we have, in the first round, we'll take three. There is uh, There are two questions in the chat box and there is one raised hand. Uh, so let me read out uh, the first question by Omkar Bhole. Smriti hasn't spoken, Alika. Huh? Smriti's turn hasn't come. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Smriti, yes, yes, yes. Your, your... Uh, it is okay. I can take it. I can just say that, uh, in fact, many of this um, suspicion about India because the more I read uh, 71, the more I understand the dynamics of the bilateral relationship because the liberation war itself has been completely politicized in the Bangladesh's domestic context. And uh, obviously that will have a repercussion on India-Bangladesh relations. Uh, you know, there are uh, stakeholders of this particular debate. And, uh, you know, only few families have, you know, are claiming that everything. So that becomes very difficult. I mean, that India finds itself in a very sticky wicket and you can't escape that. And China doesn't have, like, for example, I have also heard people rationalizing and saying, what could have Chinese done? You know, they stood by uh, Pakistan. So you see that, you know, I always see that there is a lot of rationalizing the intellectuals or the elites in Bangladesh do for China. But when it comes to India, I don't see that kind of rationalization. Uh, in many of my conversations, I always have this argument that when you are rationalizing this, how, how is it that you are not rationalizing that? Anyway, I would uh, go for the Q&A. Okay, thank you. No, no, I think you've raised a very important point, which uh, Ambassador Chakravarti also raised, that, you know, we in India find it baffling that there is this kind of a positivity towards China. That is what we, we, I mean, we are good guys. Why are you behaving like this with us? I, I think we need to, we need to question this a bit more. Um, I remember years back, the, the, the strategic community in India was shaken up by this article, which was provocatively titled, Is India a Big Bully in the Neighborhood? And that kind of discourse has sort of, you know, faded in, faded out, but not gone away entirely. And my 
fear is that that some shades of that argument are still around and that this whole attitude of you know this is our backyard I mean, many you can see this repeated over and over again by many uh, of our fraternity in the scholarly as well as uh, journalistic field you know talking about the neighborhood as a, as india's backyard so i think somewhere we need to go into why why is this perception so much in favor of india and so maybe they 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 some people have answers here okay uh, i i must get down to questions uh, so uh, the the question by omkar bhole was how does bangladesh look at the use of brahmaputra by china for energy generation and water diversion is that a crucial issue in bangladesh china bilateral talks also possibility of cooperative framework between china india bangladesh so i think uh, ambassador kabir had touched upon this uh, let me give you all the questions and then we'll take one round um, um ambassador goel has a comment for smriti what is the source of chinese interest in bangladesh i think there are two one to balance india and access to maritime security you talk of trilateral cooperation how can that be a reality given the nature of chinese interest uh, right uh, i will let um, uh, era mashraf uh, ask his question if he can be unmuted hello thank you very much um, for giving me the opportunity uh, and i'm really enjoying the discussion My question is rather technical, and it emanates because um, yesterday I learned also about China's Belt and Road Initiative in Kazakhstan in the region. So I was trying to understand the scenario in Bangladesh. So when we look at China-Pakistan economic corridor, the whole Belt and Road Initiative there in Pakistan is very centrally organized. So you have CPEC authority, and you can also go and see websites where all the projects between the governments are. how is it working in bangladesh um is it um outside government um is it um uh, individually based so how does technically how is does it work in bangladesh that's my question so thank you very much um thank you so of these three questions two are directed at ambassador kabir and one to smriti so over to you ambassador kabir oh well thank you i think uh Uh, i think I'll, let me begin with the last question yeah bangladeshi case is similar to pakistan's in terms of implementation procedure nothing outside the government because these are big projects that are being talked about and generally these are controlled or managed by the government but here let me add one thing unlike pakistan bangladesh is uh, as i said at the beginning is choosy about uh, uh, selection of Uh, the projects for example recently when padda bridge was being inaugurated chinese ambassador was trying to brand it as a part of bri project bangladesh government gave them a big thumbs down in the sense that and chinese ambassador was uh, to organize a seminar in his mission and that had to be cancelled because bangladesh government told them point blank this is bangladeshi project you were the contractor even our prime minister was he said a very blunt words for the chinese so bangladesh is very forthright with regard to this and also on the quad issue when the chinese ambassador threatened which was mentioned earlier i think bangladesh government was very outcome they they came out very strongly and said that well i mean uh, we understand what to be done we don't want to ask anybody to uh, to just advise us where we should go or not go so that's what it is i mean we know exactly what we are trying to do and we don't uh, i mean uh, we can take it and take take a stand both against india as well as against china if required i mean based on our national interest number one now why the the the, the confusion about uh, bangladesh uh, india china relationship no i think bangladesh uh, in bangladesh we don't see Uh, we don't actually weigh india or china as such as a kind of adversary or uh, in in terms of trilateral relationship we look at the relationship from bilateral perspective our relationship with india is with india our relationship with china is bangladesh china relationship so we don't have any comparative kind of relationship paradigm to 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 weigh all the time so the way you look at uh, uh, i mean india looks at bangladesh 
from either pro India or pro Chinese or softer to India or softer to China. We don't look at it that way. We treat it as a bilateral issue. And we have to also recognize the fact that no, every country's requirements are different. And no other country can meet all the requirements of any particular country. So where India can help us, we go to India, we work with India with comfort. Where China can help us, we work with China, for example. And Shruti was mentioning about the defense deal or why the money was not utilized. I mean, there is a fundamental, if I may, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm a little blunt on that, but I can tell you, Bangladeshis are familiar with the consumer, better consumer products since Pakistan time. And we have a test for more, better quality of stuff available in the world. And we buy it from the market. So if the Indian products are better, we'll definitely buy. If the products are not better or reputation wise, they are not better or look better, then Bangladesh will not buy. As simple as that. And efficient Indian military is not using Indian, uh, I mean, we use SLRs in 71, self loading rifles. And I am told that the Indian army itself is now removing the SLRs for not being uh, working properly. Indian mini equipment are being replaced. So, so if that kind of situation is, is taking place inside India, then Bangladesh is obviously look at the market and we buy from where we get the better quality stuff, as simple as that. So we don't attach anything other than quality and that would serve our purpose. So, I mean, uh, to judge us from the basis of that whether we like or dislike, no, I don't think. Rather, we work based on the utility point of uh, any particular area of our interest. Thank you. Um, Shruti, would you like to take that uh, question? Yeah. I, I would like to say, you know, where uh, Humayun Bai just finished. I think when you look at Bangladesh's own defense preparedness and you look at the geography, of course, India is the factor. And... Uh, uh, I know that for uh, past few years, India has been trying, uh, you know, to change that uh, uh, blue land and red land kind of uh, kind of concept so that uh, we get out from that mindset. And uh, of course, I would not like to comment on the Chinese quality of the weapons, but that 500 million, when I said what I was raising, uh, the kind of questions which were raised for that, I didn't see the similar kind of question being raised when uh, you know the defense cooperation agreement with China was signed because I was trying to find out. I looked at the old newspaper, tried to find out that is there any discussion? Then why this discussion? Could be also social media is now social media was not there. One can say this as a variation, but I have seen that there has been completely muted kind of uh, uh, response. And uh, second is that you know the question of uh, I do understand you know the statement came from the. Uh, ministry on the on the quad issue, but I didn't see much of the writings in the newspaper as you see in the context of any kind of India uh, Bangladesh thing. Like for example, you know that uh, particular news report uh, quoting Borer Kagas, uh, the Hindu quoted. Uh, I think it was given a widespread publicity, and I don't see such kind of wide widespread publicity when uh, you know the Chinese ambassador can make a statement and get away. With this, I think if Indian ambassador says this, there is definitely going to be a demonstration. I, you know, I can, uh, having lived in Dhaka, I can really vouch for that. And uh, about uh, the chair's uh, question about that, you know, how we, why is it that we have not been able to leverage the people to people contact? I think that has become a kind of trouble because, you know, the, these people are also part of political parties and they, uh, whenever there is anything which goes wrong, there is expectation, you are democracy, you have, because this is not just, you know, uh, Human Bhai also knows, this is the question also is asked in Bangladesh, you yourself is democracy, so how are you supporting this or that? You know, that is that is a basic expectation that how do you condone certain activities? So that point of time, you can't say oh, non-interference. We don't bother if it is military and all. So that is not something acceptable. So that is, I always find this dichotomy of the expectation uh, by certain groups, the ruling elite want, has a particular expectation. They want to sustain in power. The people want a change. So they have an expectation that India should be part of that uh, process of changing uh, the ruling regime. So that creates a problem. The last issue is about this non, you know, this concept of non-interference as far as China is concerned. I think many of the writings which are coming 
uh, in English by the Chinese uh, writers, it says that uh, China's non-interference is a very different kind of thing. You know, it does not, uh, you know, actually it uh, basically relies on any government, doesn't give a, a really damn about the nature of the government. So that way, if if the government is not elected, so in that sense, it, if even if it doesn't have the people support, China will deal with it. Second is this issue of non-interference is going to change the more China invests in uh, Bangladesh, you know, we have seen what is happening in Nepal uh, in terms of uh, trying to bring the two political parties together. We saw that happening in Sri Lanka, where the Chinese embassy funded uh, the tuk-tuks there, which carried out posters saying that China has created uh, this much of a job and all. And also, I was recently looking at it, the Padma Bris thing. Uh, I was looking at the Chinese embassy website. It says about, speaks about the job creation. Uh, in spite of there has been conflict between the Chinese labor and the Bangladesh local laborers uh, in Chittagong and other areas. I think in one of the incident, one of the Bangladeshi was also killed. Yes, but yes. then again, yeah, they, so they are trying to project it as employment generation so that, uh, you know, this question of debt, of course, Bangladesh is much far away from the debt trap uh, kind of thing. They have been extremely... Uh, careful about that. Uh, one last, if you allow me, about uh, Ambassador Boyle's uh, question. I think uh, I was basically referring to cooperation in terms of the river water non-traditional security, not in terms of any kind of traditional security uh, cooperation as far as uh, Bangladesh is concerned. Uh, so therefore, you know, in terms of like somebody, Ambassador Kabir was also mentioning about this uh, um, uh, data part of the flood and all. I know that there is a data sharing between India and uh, Bangladesh. There is a data sharing between China and Bangladesh. So somewhere if we can come together and, uh, you know, access the data, then this question of China not sharing the data and all will go away. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, now we go to the next round. There is one question uh, in the chat box again from you. <laughs> And uh, Yukti, uh, Yukti's question, I think, would be best answered by Ambassador Kabir again, because uh, she wants to know how can Bangladesh ensure that it does not fall into the debt trap uh, while trying to balance India? So if, uh, uh, well, I, think, I think basically I think... address this question of uh, China's debt trap diplomacy. Okay. And um, uh, how, how is Bangladesh so sure that it will escape this debt trap? Because obviously India is in, in view. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Good question. But I think that uh, you must trust our collective conscience and collective judgment. And I believe that so far, Bangladesh has been very careful, cautious uh, in terms of borrowing from outside. And uh, I think it has been uh, verified by, you know, all those international agencies and they think that Bangladesh is still on the right track. And my sense is that Whatever kind of government is here, like the current government, other government, future governments, Bangladesh government is rather little cautious, careful about borrowing from outside. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so that answers the dead trap question. Uh, now, I don't see any more questions in the chat box and I don't see any more hands. Uh, and we are down to our last five minutes in any case. Uh, so I'll give uh, one minute or so to each of the participants for any kind of concluding thoughts they may want to make or not make. Uh, it's up to them. But Ambassador Chakravarti, would you like to come? Yes. Unmute, unmute. I want to flag one issue which is going to exercise both countries. And that is uh, Bangladesh's uh, graduation out of LDC status uh, around 2026. And uh, allied to that is the question of uh, Chinese companies starting manufacturing in, uh, in Bangladesh. Now, uh, at, the, at the current moment, uh, Bangladesh enjoys duty-free access into the Indian market as an LDC. Now, if China starts manufacturing there, and uh, which may turn out to be not just manufacturing, but just assembly, then uh, there's going to be uh, some issues that will, uh, that will arise, uh, uh, whether those goods can enter the Indian market. <coughs> because 
the rules of origin will uh, kick in. And uh, then there's going to be some problem there. Unless, of course, we are uh, mature enough and go for a comprehensive economic partnership argument, which will deal with all these issues. I believe some talks are still going on. And I hope that is uh, accomplished because this I foresee as an issue that is going to bother us in the future. Thank you. Um, yes, Ambassador Kabir, any uh, Yeah, I think I, uh, uh, I, I should thank uh, dear friend Pinak for raising that issue. Uh, the uh, comprehensive economic partnership with India is under discussion, active discussion. So we hope that some progress would be seen in the coming days. Likewise, we are also working with China for a free trade agreement because we are conscious of the fact that after 2026, we will not have that advantage of LDC uh, benefits that we used to get uh, from many countries. So the next tool that we'll have to use is to get duty-free market access through the FTAs. And we are talking to Jap Japanese, we are talking to Chinese, we are the Americans are also sounding out that. Uh, uh, so I think Bangladesh is now very actively, I should say very actively pursuing this track of engaging for free trade agreement with many important countries. And obviously India and China will figure prominently in that list because of our ongoing relationship and the future prospect for our economic partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Smriti? I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> That's right. no, no, I, I think uh, uh, it, it, it has been a, it's been a fascinating uh, exchange. Mm -hmm. I, the, what's, what's really been of uh, great interest to me personally is you know, the, the nuances that have come across in the three presentations. Uh, where there seems to be a somewhat a convergence about the need to strengthen India-Bangladesh ties, uh, but clearly a concern that uh, it is the China-Bangladesh relationship which is, you know, the shadow of which is falling on India-Bangladesh relations. And, and that's something that, that bothers me because it fits into a larger discourse uh, that, that, that has now begun to dominate uh, many uh, writings in India, which is about how our neighbors are using China as a leverage against India, uh, how they are trying to counterbalance uh, uh, India uh, by bringing in China, uh, how China is becoming a countervailing factor in the region. And, and it seems to me that uh, this uh, is, is both a consequence and then a factor in, uh, in, in deepening this kind of understanding. A consequence uh, that we cannot entirely deny that there is some attempt by our neighbors to play off India and China and reap advantages uh, from that. I mean, well, that's real politic, if you will, but that is a direct uh, consequence of the deterioration in China-India relations. And I've always believed that the best antidote to completely minimizing China as a lever China's leverages in the subcontinent or China's role as a countervailing factor is to improve Sino-Indian relations. I mean, that's really the, the, the core of, of the problem as I would see, but increasing tensions are inevitably going to spill over into our relations with our neighbors because today, China factor is no longer just a part of that, you know, string of pearls or China is trying to curry favor. It's, it's not that. And, I do believe that uh, this framework actually is very deleterious as far as our own relations with our neighbors go. Because if, if we are constantly going to look at them as playing off China and India, I think that would not have a very good impact. So um, that's, that's all that I, I would like to say by way of conclusion. Bangladesh, like I think our other neighbors, um, and Ambassador Kabir has made that very clear, is quite uh, well able to think and decide about what is in their best interests. And uh, clearly, while they are having a very good deal with China at the moment, India is not somebody that they can, you know, just keep onto one side. We are joined at the hip in many ways. So I think the 
there is a greater problem as far as our neighbors are concerned because they cannot not have good ties with India. But obviously, China is a much bigger factor in their in their developmental story today. So there we have uh, a situation. I thank you all very much, and I leave the further thanks to our organizer Rangoli. Um, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. On behalf of ICS, I would like to thank all the speakers and our chair for joining us today. And the video of today's discussion will be available on the ICS YouTube platform. Please also join us next Wednesday for a seminar on South Korea's foreign policy under the Yoon Suk Yeol administration. Thank you for logging in and have a good evening.